It's my pleasure and honor to introduce Amy. And I've been pondering what to say. I have so much to say, and uh, I wouldn't know where to start, so I'll just keep it short so you don't make you nervous. I tend to cry, and I don't want to cry, and, don't want to cry and all of that. But Sheeny, you know, I think a metric of your success, or I like to think of a metric of success as a scientist, is when your mentees surpass you. And she is the epitome of that. She is my second former PhD student, and I couldn't be more proud of you. So thank you. Take it away. Thank you, Monica. Um, I guess that's something nice to hear from your PhD advisor. Um, and thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, I learned that you don't have um, as often people crossing the pond that I'm going to talk about, Basel. Um, so I'm back uh, here after doing my PhD with Monica after 13 years. So it's exciting uh, to, to be um, <clears throat> back in, in the States and, um, and a, a real pleasure that I have the opportunity to, to talk about this work also uh, here and, and to you. Um, you have an impressive uh, microbiome center and the, the Hawk Institute seems to, I'm very impressed by, by its size and the colleagues and the diversity of topics that are studied here. And I think this is a really great place uh, to be. I can envy any uh, graduate student or postdoc working in this environment because I think it's really timely to get into this uh, area or topic of research because this is just certainly uh, exploding and, and growing for the next uh, couple of decades. Of course, I'm biased, but I think I'm not completely wrong about these predictions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the ocean as a treasure trove for novel taxa enzymes and bioactive compounds and what I... Um, but before I, I really get started, uh, just to give you some, some background about our research interests. So I'm running um, a group that's called the Microbiome Research Lab. We are, in general terms, interested in studying the structure, diversity, and function of microbial community. Of course, this is very generic, but this is also the way that uh, we actually operate and the way that we approach. Studying uh, this topic is that um, we tackle this from a bioinformatic or computational side. So we do develop bioinformatic software and databases to have the resources and tools uh, that we like to combine with experimental uh, research or evidence to study ecologically and evolutionarily relevant questions of microbial communities, how they form, what drives them, and uh, as systems that we are looking into more in a more focused way is the mammalian gut and the ocean. And I'm going to talk more about the ocean, but of course all of this would not be possible with a, without a wonderful group of, of people that do the actual work and allow me to talk about it and um, the funding that um, supports this study. Um, just last background information, I, I'm from, uh, my institution is uh, right here, this is ETH Zurich, it's the campus that's uh, on, on, on a hill uh, close to, to Zurich that you see in the background at the beautiful uh, lake of Zurich, in the background you should, you would usually, usually see uh, mountains, uh, so it's, it's a beautiful place to, to work at, and what I really like about my work is that you can actually study the ocean from there, and um, and uh, get uh, really interesting uh, things um, to, to research. So now <clears throat> the protagonist of, of the talk, the ocean textbook knowledge tells you that it covers about seventy percent of the ocean of the of the Earth's surface. But um, if you think three dimensionally, of course, there's a depth uh, of the ocean as well. And actually, the mean depth of the ocean is three point eight kilometers. This is uh, quite a huge volume uh, that you can look at as a biosphere where microorganisms thrive and live. And indeed, the biomass that microbes make up in the ocean uh, is two thirds. So two thirds of, of all biomass is microbially um, in, in nature. This is different to terrestrial environments where plants make up the most of the biomass, but in the ocean, it's, it's really uh, the microbes. And they're also the organisms that uh, drive biogeochemical cycles, most um, or one, one Key uh, important one is, of course, photosynthesis, uh, the process by which uh, we absorb or CO2 is fixed from the environment, converted into biomass. Through the function of the biological pump, the fixed carbon makes it eventually to the ocean sediment that, of course, is important to keep running um, because the equilibrium um, uh, in, in the end <clears throat> makes the ocean a, a carbon sink. So it's, it's important that we understand uh, how it's functioning, what the diversity is there, and how the mechanisms work. But not only from this um, ecological, um, global scale importance of it, 
It also serves as a source for biotechnologically important uh, compounds. It's sometimes coined as the blue biotech um, area now where we can um, basically make discoveries uh, in the ocean um, and the organisms that, that live in there. And I'm going to talk um, more about this. Um, but just to go a couple of steps back, um, so trying to generalize across different microbiomes. So there's people in the audience that uh, will look at different systems, but it's very, it's going to be very similar for the different uh, biomes that, that we look at that things started with the isolation of some key microbes that um, represent or are dominant in the environments and in the ocean, there are organisms like Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus, which are the most abundant phototrophic uh, unicellular cells in the world and SAR11 is the most abundant heterotrophic um, bacterium uh, in, in, <clears throat> in the ocean. And um, basically, uh, after isolating them and being able to study them uh, in the lab, uh, we got a much uh, better understanding of the, the uh, biology of these organisms. We started to realize that there's not um, all traits can be attributed to a single individual or isolate that was sequenced, but that the diversity of these organisms is large when we start to look into nature. And how we can actually study um, these organisms in nature with the methods that are available and the challenges that most of these microorganisms are not easily uh, uh, culture in the laboratory setting is to go for a technology, a next generation sequencing, which over the past uh, decades has revolutionized how we study microorganisms because we have direct access to their genomes um, by this methodology. And of course, uh, it, would, it is uh, also important that we collect data um, in forms of, of samples and luckily, uh, Craig Venter uh, pioneered um, studying the, the ocean in terms of its microbiome by going with this uh, sailing boat to the Sargasso Sea and using back then Sanger sequencing uh, to start scratching really the, the, the tip of the tip of the iceberg to see what uh, the genetic or the organismal diversity is out there in the ocean. And even back then, uh, we got quickly to realize that uh, any sequence almost that we looked at that was sampled from marine organisms was entirely not uh, new or not observed previously um, from the other model systems that we, um, that we were able to study uh, in, in prior to that. Um, and then over the years, there have been other uh, marine expeditions that have been going on um, um, in the first place to, to measure physical oceanographic um, uh, data, but then uh, clearly saw also the added value to sample organisms. And so uh, these geotraces, for example, become, became a biogeotraces uh, project so that um, also the biology was taken into consideration in monitoring and um, surveying uh, the system. I have been extremely lucky to have been at the right time at the right place to embark on a project that's called Terra Oceans. And this is a, a, a project that I'm going to talk about mostly. So most of the data that I'm going to present um, originate from, from this project. And uh, well, let's, let's get started with this. So this is um, why it's called Terra Ocean. Terra is a sailing boat. It's a schooner, 36 meters. It's not uh, huge, but Actually, the, the only uh, tractable way of doing such a, a, a global expedition with the limited resource that were available because it uh, sails, so wind is for free um, until now. So that was a, <laughs> a really important component of why it was even possible to, to, to do this. And um, if you would like to look at this map, so the, the boat has its uh, home harbor in uh, the east coast of France. In Lorient, and the expedition started in 2009, um, crossing the Mediterranean Sea, going through the, the Red Sea, evading some pirates around Somalia, going down the Indian Ocean, crossing the South Atlantic Ocean, go around the south tip of Chile. Um, the original plan was to really circumnavigate the ocean. In 2011, the boat was somewhere here, then Fukushima happened. So the boat uh, took different. Um, half back home, basically going through the Panama Channel, crossing the North Atlantic Ocean, and doing an additional uh, expedition in the polar oceans to uh, also capture the diversity in um, the Arctic Ocean. Some numbers, uh, about 35,000 samples were collected for molecular sequencing, for morphological characterization, for imaging, and other types of, of uh, data, and uh, 210 different stations where hand selected to represent as much uh, heterogeneity that exists in the ocean environment as, as possible. So different water masses, different types of, of current systems and, uh, and so on. Uh, 
So um, yeah, back then, as I said, it was a very uh, risky project because we did not know where, where this is going, but um, history now looking back, uh, it was an extremely successful project with uh, yeah, describing and, and testing and, and finding new insights into this ocean ecosystem for different kind of organisms, because one of the um, objectives was to go from viruses to small animals, so to cover a large spectrum of organismal sizes to um, characterize or describe the, the phylogenetic and functional diversity that is found in these organisms, but then also go into, into mechanisms, how do these uh, organisms disperse, uh, what's about the latitudinal gradient, um, and how is uh, carbon sequestrated by the biological pump. So, and even 10 years after um, collecting the original data, there's a very important fundamental work that's, that's coming out. I don't know if you've seen last week, uh, it was an article in Asia that describes the origin uh, between um, herpes viruses and giant viruses. Uh, so at the very base of when these two um, uh, lineages um, <clears throat> diverged there, we found representatives that, that explain the transition from, from one to the other. And uh, apart from that, this is a great project for uh, outreach. So um, it was uh, broadcasted on television. There have been books written. And uh, every time when Tara has, a, has, a, um, has some time, spends some time in Harbor State's expeditions and educational programs. So they invite uh, um, high school kids onto the boat and explain them about the importance of uh, conserving the, the ocean and, uh, and the work of, of the project itself. OK. Um, so just to get us all on the same page, uh, I can be very short on this. So as a microbiome, I consider uh, um, an environment where we have organisms uh, that uh, are individuals. They are somehow related to each other. Um, you could summarize the, the groups of individuals as, uh, as species, what we like to do as humans talk about species, but I will get to the species concept in a, later uh, in the presentation. Uh, but in the end, we also look at populations or individuals that somehow uh, are ecologically or evolutionarily uh, cohesively related to each other. Uh, they all form together the community and the, they live in some environment of which we can um, characterize and describe um, parameters, the environmental parameters. So this is, I think, a pipeline that everybody in the room should be familiar with. Uh, if you extract DNA from microbial community, uh, we now have ways to shortcut sequence. Uh, these uh, genomes that you can extract and then reconstruct by assembling these small pieces back together into the uh, original genomes and address questions such as uh, who is there by taxonomic profiling, identifying which organisms are present at what abundance in the microbial communities and what can they do. So what kind of genomic potential do they encode by um, analyzing their gene content and uh, who can do what if we are able to reconstruct entire genomes and then assign genes to the host of, of origin. And uh, this, and well, this is uh, in the end still all computational. So if we would like to understand the mechanisms of as to why and how some um, things happen, there is still the requirement and very important requirement to follow up and test with reductionist approaches to, 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 um, to do the experiments to validate the hypotheses that uh, in silico data can generate. Okay, um, so one of the first questions that we just uh, were wondering about is what's the genetic diversity we um, observe out there in the ocean and from Craig Venture's tour. Uh, we already learned that there, there must be genes um, and, and many of them that we still don't know yet. And um, because of technological development, um, so basically going from Sanger sequencing to Illumina high throughput sequencing, we were able to, um, to sequence three orders of magnitude more data from an ocean uh, sample. And basically this allowed us to, to get closer to saturating the sampling of, uh, of genes from specific samples. Um, as I showed you before, these are some stations that uh, Tara stopped and, and took samples of. And now I'm going to talk mostly about bacteria um, and archaea because uh, they're easier to work with. And this is just uh, the, uh, the spectrum of uh, organismal diversity that uh, we have focused on in, in, in this work that I'm presenting here. So long story short, after going to reconstruct the genomes and identifying which kind of genes are encoded in uh, in these 243 uh, metagenomes, you find in total about 40 million different genes. And in this case, a gene is defined as an instance of a gene per species. So, um, and 
more than 80% of these genes, if you search through publicly available data and try to match it to a species carrying this gene, there were, there were just no representatives available back then, since 2015. Um, meaning that there were, as expected, a lot of genes that were entirely uh, novel and, and newly added to uh, our knowledge base uh, through such an exercise. And um, something else, <clears throat> if, we, if we asked where does all the novel uh, tea come from, um, this plot shows surface ocean samples, uh, deep chlorophyll maximum samples, because the majority of organisms actually lives not directly at the surface, but somewhat deeper. And then the mesopelagic ocean, which uh, constitutes the dark ocean. So when the light uh, availability becomes less than 1%, down to about um, 2,000 meters. And uh, the columns represent the oceans or the regions where the samples came from. And um, maybe just to the whole summary is that in the surface, more or less half of the genes were previously known. This is represented by the blue part, while the other half was, was unknown. But the deeper you go, the fraction of new genes that we discovered increased. And so the, the largest fraction, more than 90% of the genes from the deeper oceans, from the dark oceans, were previously unknown. And another outlier is the Southern Ocean. So you see that also here, the fraction of unknown genes was much, much higher than in other ocean areas. And this is um, probably best explained because the Southern Ocean, first of all, is really rough uh, to, to take and uh, to go there and, and sample, in particular with a sailing boat and, um, and the deep ocean. So these are harder to access sites. We have some idea or we had some idea previously also from easily accessible regions, coastal waters, uh, surface waters, but the deeper you go or uh, the, to, if you go to more um, inaccessible sites, the more genetic diversity you would, uh, you would find. Then when we asked, so if we wanted to get into ecological questions such as uh, what kind of species exist and how um, do communities or what are the drivers, ecological drivers that shape the communities, we would need to be able to translate all the mass of information into, uh, and into compositions, to have quantitative data about which taxa do we observe at what abundance. The challenge was that if you map the sequencing reads to publicly available uh, databases like the genomes that existed back then, less than uh, or about 10% of the data could actually be assigned to known taxa, which of course means you miss the rest or 90% of the data that you actually collected. And that uh, to basically address this problem, we have worked on developing software that can reconstruct phylogenetic marker genes from metagenomic data. So basically like the 16SR RNA gene that is used for taxonomic profiling, we reconstructed um, protein coding phylogenetic marker genes from the samples themselves. So basically we build our new taxonomic marker gene database from the data um, to quantify what type of taxa do I observe at what abundance in these different samples. And through this development, basically, um, the, the goal was to be able to describe community similarity. So this is a principal component analysis where the data points are colored by the ocean region where a sample originated from. So this is Mediterranean Sea, Red Sea, Indian Ocean, North Atlantic Ocean, and, and so on. But that, that is not as important as appreciating that there is not really a regional or a biogeographic clustering of communities, meaning if from macroecology, you may expect that the closer you um, sample an area, the more similar the communities will be. The types of uh, fauna and flora that you find in an environment are more similar to each other the closer you are. But this effect is, is not visible, at least not explaining uh, this variation of, of community composition for, for microbes. So they must have different mechanisms of why they look um, more similar to each other than uh, biogeographic, um, a bi purely biogeographic explanation. And um, this is somewhat also supported by, by ecological theory where the environment uh, selects which microbes strive and, and become abundant. In this case, we were wondering which environmental factor is it actually in the ocean that explains this variability best. So technically it's the first principal component that explains most of the variation in the data. Um, so we 
basically correlated it against all the environmental data that we collected, salinity, uh, temperature, nitrate, uh, phosphate concentration, light availability, depth, distance to coast, and so on. And then we observed this uh, correlation and thought, wow, this is amazing. Um, and the factor that we correlated it against is temperature. So there's a very strong relationship between temperature and community composition, as you see, irrespective of the location where these communities were sampled. And so we went uh, on and, and did this more excessively. So this is a bit technical because you also have something that's called all spatial autocorrelation. Again, if you sample uh, a community that is close in, in space, uh, then you have a confounding um, component because environmental similarity is more likely to be higher the closer you are. So to account for this fact, you try to remove this and um, it's then a geographic distance corrected similarity between community composition or gene composition and environmental factors. So uh, the essence of this is uh, you identify which environmental factor really explains uh, the variation in taxonomic and gene functional composition. And you saw that temperature, you see here that temperature and oxygen are uh, both the, the most, the, the strongest um, explanatory factors. And through some um, test experiments uh, that uh, I'm not going into details now, we um, pinpointed temperature, the driving factor, and oxygen to be a co correlated factor, which makes sense because temperature and oxygen solubility are directly correlated. Um, so I did this type of work still when I was a postdoc in a purely computational lab. And when you are in such an environment, then uh, people will not ask you what's the mechanism and how does this work metabolically. They will ask you, hey, can you give me the data and I will predict what temperature uh, the sample came from. So, okay, this is an exercise that we did. And so, so by uh, machine learning or um, regression, you can model the um, community, use the community composition as your data and try to predict the temperature of where the sample came from. And you see that, um, that you can predict, you can construct models that uh, explain 86% of the variation. Um, so you can, to some extent, very well um, predict the temperature of where a sample came from. Now, of course, this is completely useless exercise in practical terms because you can put a thermometer into the water and you know the temperature of uh, <laughs> the environment, uh, but it's, uh, it's a statistical uh, approach to verify how closely uh, linked temperature as an environmental factor is in determining the composition of microbial communities in the ocean. Now, this should ring some bells, but before we get uh, into why, um, what we were asked is, yeah, but maybe this is a Tara uh, artifact. So this is one study. Can you replicate this? Can you generalize this across different studies? So back then we couldn't, but now uh, you saw at the beginning that there were many more expeditions and more data became available. We repeated this exercise with an um, uh, extended database that uh, we constructed where we have many more samples than the 240 um, from Tara Oceans, but uh, across the, oh yeah, here, uh, the, the different um, projects that generated data from other places. And as a bioinformatician, if you try to generalize across different studies, because each of these studies has their own effects, you expect these correlations to become worse, but still recognizable. And what we observed here in this example is just completely shocking. Because the correlations get better, the more data you use and, that, and the more variable or if you integrate data from different projects. It was completely unexpected. And to go a step further to, um, to test whether there was a study effect, um, you can also train models and leave out entire studies, use the data to, to model um, and make predictions, and then test your model on the study that you kept out of the training when you generated these models. And as you can see here, you can basically um, create models irrespective of the study that you're going to test then the, the predictive um, validity for. So this is a relationship that is extremely strong. The temperature really has an impact um, and a very predictable one on community composition. Now, if we hear temperature, 
Yeah, it's fine. Okay. If we hear temperature, of course, uh, this is somewhat worrisome because we know that the oceans are warming. And uh, one area, and, and this warming is actually not proportional to the whole global ocean. Um, in fact, it's the Arctic Ocean where the change in temperature, the increase in temperature is disproportionately high. So the Arctic Ocean is, is warming at a, at a much faster rate than uh, the average ocean. And um, so that begs then the question, how do microbial communities respond to um, these changes? And which regions would be most affected uh, by, by what terms? So we basically ask the question, how do communities, and I put it into parentheses and say, adjust to environmental conditions because um, the terms adapt and to acclimate have their own uh, connotation, ecologically um, defined ones. So because it could be an ecological response or an evolutionary response. Um, so this was the, the driving question. And actually our aim was to deconvolute or disentangle the effect, ecological effects from evolutionary effects, uh, sorry, from physiological effects um, that, that uh, drive these changes. Um, I hope I become a bit more clear um, in a minute, but just to introduce the data set. Um, so Terra Oceans did not only sequence metagenomes, but also metatranscriptomes. So whenever you see a green um, box, that means that it's a sample where both metagenomes and metatranscriptomes were sampled. And that allowed us basically to integrate these two different types of omics data um, to address the question when you sequence the metatranscriptomes. So these are pieces of RNA that is extracted from microbial communities. What determines a change in this transcriptome? Um, and there's basically two main mechanisms that can explain this. One is <clears throat> the community composition changes. So let's say you have sample A and B, and you may have a difference in the composition of the communities. And if you think about just very simplified, three different species, and they encode for different genes, and these genes are expressed. So one gene is only present in species two and three, and the other gene is present only in species three and one. If you change the composition of the community, and if these genes were constitutively expressed, that means that the pool of transcripts that you generate will change. This is basically shown here in the top row. So I change the community. The gene expression remains the same, but as a result, the number of transcripts that you generate will depend on the shift of the community composition. The other mechanism could be that the community composition remains exactly the same between A and B, but the gene expression changes. <clears throat> so it could be that gene B is now is more highly expressed and because I have a community compositional shift, um, sorry, a gene expression shift, the transcripts that are produced in this community would also change, but with the exact same community composition. So it's just that they express the genes differently and the outcome is exactly the same. And so it's, there's two mechanisms, these two mechanisms, gene expression change or community compositional change, or I will refer to it also as turnover, of the community may explain a change in the transcript pool. And the big challenge here was then to explain which of those two mechanisms um, are at play. And is there a difference in the use of the different mechanisms throughout the global oceans? And I will not bore you with the bioinformatic uh, exercise that we had to go through to actually be able to address this, but jump straight into the result which is reflected in this plot. It's a bit uh, complex, so I will walk you through. Basically, what is shown here is uh, on the x-axis, the temperature range, and what it reflects is the delta, so the difference of the temperature between two samples that you look at each other. Meaning that for this data point, for example, there's a very small temperature change, maybe 0.5 degrees. And if you look at, um, at um, and they are sorted by, sorry, they're sorted by, by temperature and um, they represent changes of what's realistic um, according to IPCC models in the next uh, decades to come. So it's, it's about, it's a small temperature change, um, about 
up to two degrees. So this is quite realistic still. And then the, the samples are sorted by uh, the origin. So if the, the water, if the origin is, is warm water, so more towards tropical waters, it's more on the right-hand side. If it's polar waters, it's on the left-hand side. The, the y-axis is basically um, the result of disentangling whether a community changes as a function of turnover, so community compositional change, or a function of gene expression changes. So the two mechanisms that I talked about. And what we should take from this uh, analysis is that community compositional changes, so the turnover of organisms within a community, explain more of the um, transcript pool changes in cold waters, while in warm tropical waters, the change in the transcript pool is more driven by the gene expression changes of the organisms, but not necessarily with a large difference in their in the composition. And what that uh, suggests is that changes in the structure, so the organisms that make up a community, will be more strongly, will be first and more strongly happening in polar cold waters. So that um, it's, it's for, see, well, these data suggest that um, in the polar oceans, the communities may not be able to acclimate to environmental change as much as more tropical communities. And the only way that um, they can respond to their, well, in, in terms of the activity for which we use the meta proxy is by, by exchanging species, by turning over um, the community compositions. All right, I'll switch uh, gears now um, because this was a lot about abiotic factors, um, but in the real environment, of course, organisms also interact with each other. So there is a function, it's a function of biotic and abiotic factors that determine community composition. And um, apart from primary metabolism, um, many organisms also have a component uh, that's, that produces the secondary metabolites that are not really necessary for their um, survival and, and reproduction, but they um, provide um, advantages. So, um, the secondary metabolites, there's many different types of um, compounds that are produced by microbes that uh, change their um, interactive behavior with other organisms. That could be vitamins that are produced by bacteria and uh, other organisms like, like proteus and larger eukaryotes benefit from it. Um, they may produce toxins to fight against other organisms. Um, secondary metabolites may also involve molecules um, mediate communication between uh, organisms like, like quorum sensing uh, or scavengers um, where, where organisms may have an advantage of, for example, um, um, excreting uh, proteins that, that scavenge things like iron uh, from the environment, which makes it interesting because then the biotic uh, effect has an effect on the abiotic component of the environment also. So it's, it's not black and white, it's getting a bit more complex. But the point is that, um, Secondary metabolites also include, um, they're often produced by so-called biosynthetic gene clusters. I will refer to them now as BGCs, biosynthetic gene clusters, and they often encode, um, they often encode these secondary metabolites among which they, they sometimes also refer to as natural products. And natural products may uh, ring a bell because um, these are these compounds that uh, are produced mm -hmm. by, by nature, uh, that, that's the name. Um, and they, they include components that that are um, uh, that can be very beneficial also for for us uh, humans. And one, um, of course, critical um, thing that is happening is the increase of antimicrobial resistance. And uh, projections are that within the next thirty years, more people will die of antimicrobial resistance-associated uh, diseases than people die of cancer today. So this is a serious uh, issue and the way that we have dealt with uh, um, combating antimicrobial resistance is to identify new antibiotics. Um, and the way that this has usually happened is, uh, or classically happened, is that people went out to nature and tried to identify compounds that were bioactive and, uh, and, and for example, have antimicrobial properties, but uh, also other um, drugs that are, that are now used. And so you might go into the environment and um, sample um, 
<clears throat> organisms that have been known or described to, to contain such natural products such as uh, sponges or other invertebrates, and then just go out to the environment and harvest uh, literally tons of, of them and then bring them to the laboratory, um, do some chemical fractionation, test for activity and, and, uh, and uh, identification of the structure of these compounds. Another route would be um, more sustainable is to cultivate microorganisms because very often it's symbionts of these organisms that produce actually these natural compounds and then use them in the laboratory and go the same route. Try to express the compounds that are um, bioactive and then um, that would be the more classic. Uh, the issue with this is that uh, most organisms, as I said before, are not easily cultivable in the laboratory. And second, uh, this going out to the nature and harvest is clearly a non-sustainable and irresponsible uh, approach of, of um, identifying new compounds. And so the alternative would be to uh, leverage the latest developments in genome, um, techno genome sequencing technology and, um, and the ability to uh, survey natural samples by metagenomics. So you go from a natural community, you sequence its genomes, you identify the genes that encode for biosynthetic gene clusters. You may, um, by heterologous expression and synthetic biology methods, express these proteins in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a heterologous host and then screen for bioactivity and um, identify potentially new promising candidates. Um, so with this methodology in mind, we basically ask the question, what's in the ocean in terms of potential for identifying such um, new compounds, so biosynthetically active compounds. This is the work of a PhD student uh, uh, of the past four years. So he collected the data that I presented to you before where we um, collect and generate resources for ocean microbiome uh, research. So this is just showing again uh, that you reconstruct um, metagenome, assemble genomes, and then basically merge them all into a database so that the research community also has access to these data and can make discoveries that, uh, that cannot, um, well, the more people work on these data, the better. Um, and I'll skip this slide. Um, and also this one. So this is just a way, some examples of what you can extract from these databases, like the abundance of specific organisms or genes, the transcripts, um, of, of, of specific genes and also search for biosynthetic gene clusters and see if your favorite one is in there. Um, one question was, of course, how much novelty do we uh, discover? And if you compare these biosynthetic gene clusters that are encoded by these ocean microbes to what was previously known, then you see that more than half of them are um, new. So they don't exist in, in RefSeq in the NCBI genomes databases. And if you compare them to the experimentally validated characterized compounds, then actually almost all of them have not been uh, biochemically characterized before. So there's a huge potential for the ocean microbes to encode for BGCs that um, um, contain new structures. And then the question we had was, in the ocean, are, which are the organisms that actually encode for these uh, biosynthetic gene clusters? Are these the usual suspects that we know from pre previous work like actinobacteria or there's some cyanobacteria that are known to produce compounds? So this is a plot to show how many or how diverse biosynthetic gene clusters we found across different clades. And there was one clade that was sort of the record holder um, in terms of the diversity and number of biosynthetic gene clusters observed. And if you plot this onto the tree of life, you would map it to a clade of organisms that was never heard of in the ocean. So we had to propose a new family name of, for a group of organisms. This is the work of my PhD student and I have nothing to do with the, with the names that he came up with. So uh, he named the family Eudora microbiaceae. Um, they are part of a phylum that is called Eremiobacterota, and this um, representatives of this phylum have never been described or, or, or characterized in the oceans. So it's the first time that this type of organisms is found in the ocean, and they are the most biosynthetically diverse taxa in the water column across the whole ocean. So we identify new groups of organisms that have a much higher biosynthetic potential than previously known uh, taxa, so they are good organisms to target or high value targets uh, for, for uh, novel um, chemical compound discovery. 
Well, these are minor bits um, of the story. So we had a draft genome assembly from short reads. Uh, we used um, by ultra low input uh, protocols to complete its genome from metagenome um, and identified uh, many different BGCs. And we're focusing on a specifically distant one from all known ones because that made us curious whether there's something that uh, we would find in terms of novelty. And um, this is also a bit loaded, but the reason why it was um, quite important. So when we talked with uh, natural product specialists, they looked at these BGCs and they said, well, this is very odd. This FKBM like methyl transferase, this has never been observed in a biosynthetic gene cluster. It's an enzyme that uh, is known to, uh, that was first characterized in fungi. And it's a methyl transferase. So people, so the prediction was, well, this, this is known as a O-methyl transferase, meaning you uh, add a methyl group, CH3 group onto oxygen side chains of amino acids and a protein. So that was the bioinformatic prediction. And then a lot of work went into the characterization of this, um, the product of this biosynthetic gene cluster. And um, the most interesting finding was that this uh, putative O-methyl transferase actually did not methylate oxygen, it methylated nitrogen, and it did not methylate oxygen or nitrogen on side chains of amino acids, but on the backbone. Um, so the amide bonds has the nitrogen, and these were the sites that by, by NMR, by MSMS, um, by various orthogonal uh, technologies was validated to catalyze the reaction of methylating nitrogen in the backbone of amino acids. So a completely new enzymatic reaction that would have been also mispredicted by bioinformatics. So if you reconstruct the gene tree of this enzyme and put it into um, known ones and also functionally characterized ones, these are the ones with the solid boxes, everything, every data would have supported the idea that this must be a no methyl transferase. But you see that it, it is on a long branch, so there's maybe some indication of explaining why we observe this, that uh, is in the middle of, um, of O methyl, of a gene family that is characterized as a, as a O methyl transferase, but there is within gene family diversity of uh, functional um, shifts. And it's not a good thing or not a very promoting thing to say this uh, as a bioinformatician because that shows the limits of bioinformatics. If you do the experiments and validate its function, you may discover new enzymatic activity or mechanisms if you, if you do um, the, the whole work. And, uh, but that's also exciting because it, it shows that how important it is to, to do validation experiments and how it, it uh, helps us in being better at, at, at predicting functions in the, in the future as well. And this is particularly true if you look at organisms that are evolutionarily very distant to what we know, because all that we know is described in organisms that we have studied in the laboratory that we know very well. If there's bugs out there in the ocean or in, in some other environment, and they are very distant to what we know, then you would see that novel functions have evolved in clades or lineages that we don't have very good uh, function characterization for. Okay, so I come to the last part of uh, the talk and I'm sorry if I go a few minutes over time, but this relates to the challenge of working with microbes. And one of the biggest ones is to define what is actually a relevant uh, unit of, of, of organisms. And so we know that it's difficult to talk about species um, Anyway, not within the biological species concept because microbes just reproduce very differently. And, um, and if you will, then the idea of groups of organisms that somehow are ecologically or evolutionarily cohesive is, um, is a concept that people are more willing to accept to, to, to say this we could consider as a, as a unit of um, biological relevance. So this is what I just said. Usually we use 16S sequences and cluster them by arbitrary cutoffs, like 97% is, is, is often uh, used or 100% when we use um, ASVs, optical sequence variants. Or when we compare genomes to each other, we often say, well, if it's 95% more similar to each other in terms of nucleotide sequence, then we are looking at the same species. But um, as I said, populations um, should or could be more in a more biological um, 
sensible way described as, as populations that are eco-evolutionary cohesive. And now the question is whether environmental genomics has a role in, in uh, helping us address this problem. So because in nature, we know that uh, there's ecological and evolutionary factors that drive community composition and also population uh, cohesiveness and uh, niche partitioning. And uh, these are the processes that are at play. Um, on the right hand side, you just see if you simulate uh, when you seed the ocean through a model with particles, how they distribute through the ocean. And the idea is that by selection at places where environmental conditions are favorable, microbes would start to reproduce and, and grow. And the question is, if we take snapshots of the ocean now, do we find um, a way to, to address the problem of what can be considered as uh, populations or, or ecologically cohesive units? And just to, to demonstrate the extent of this or where we stand technolo technologically speaking, what I'm showing here is a PCA again um, of, of, of distances that we're going to look at. And this is the 16S rRNA gene, full length of 55 genomes that have been sampled throughout the oceans. So there's only a single dot because they are 100% identical. 55 genomes, exact same full length 16S uh, sequence. If you start to separate these genomes by genome identity, you um, see that they are not identical genomes. Of course, they are not clonal. Um, so there's differences between the genome sequences. And if you use uh, or borrow technology from, and it has been much pushed by single cell RNA sequencing. So uh, non-dimensional scaling um, <clears throat> into two dimensions. Uh, so there's methods like UMAP and TSNE. Um, you can achieve that these distances in nonlinear space will form clusters. And, um, and if you look at these clusters then first, what you can see here on the left-hand side, for example, is that a population, so genomes um, that are very similar to, to each other do not necessarily originate all from the same ocean region. This is indicated by the different colorings, for example, on the top right-hand side. Um, and the more interesting part is if we wanted, when we try to explain why they separate into these clusters, we back mapped the environmental factors that were measured at the places where these genomes came from. So we, we could speak of reverse ecology if, if you want, and then ask what is, for example, the iron concentration of the organisms that uh, are represented by this cluster versus uh, another mm -hmm. cluster. And you can see that, um, for example, this population likes to occurs in high nitrate waters at deep waters while other organisms uh, occur at low nitrate concentrations and at high iron concentrations. So, and this is um, all statistically very significant. And our idea here is that we, we can, through this reverse ecology approach, determine why genomes are not only similar in their sequence space, but also explain how they are ecologically more similar to each other before, because they prefer to strive in environments where the ecological where the environmental uh, factors are more similar. And um, if you do this across many, many species and ask the question, which are the factors that best partition uh, species into populations, it was again temperature. So not only at the community compositional level, but also in the within species level, temperature is one of the key factors that explain how um, microbial organisms, populations um, uh, separate. Okay, sorry for going um, a bit over time. So I would like to just uh, conclude and summarize. I hope I could show you that um, by exploring uh, an ecosystem like the oceans, there is still a lot to learn from. There is a huge amount of diversity that we are able to capture now, but to understand that's the, that's the, that remains a challenge that in terms of community composition, the temperature is one of the main strongest drivers explaining the variation of observing different uh, compositional types in the ocean. Um, I think we need to, so as a future step, we keep integrating data at the global scale because the problem is if you're not able to compare your newly generated data into a global context, you may think that you have something novel, but other groups may have described this before. It's very difficult to browse through literature or to have the data to make these actual comparisons. So I think um, the idea, the motivation of our bioinformatic work is to enable people to do this type of comparisons uh, in a, in a uh, user-friendly way. Um, 
I hope I could show you also that um, when you start characterizing some of the taxonomic groups or and or functions of organisms that are encoded by these microbes, that there's a lot of discovery potential. And this is not really cherry picked for an organismal uh, for an organismal group that has previously not described, but it just happened to be the one that is the most biosynthetically diverse one. You could ask the same data set for different questions, and um, I'm I'm absolutely uh, sure that you. you if you have a lead, then you will find uh, something that is not uh, described at the moment, but the data are available, so hopefully people make use of this. Um, I think new, the latest uh, developments in, in protein structural predictions that have become available through AlphaFold and other uh, tools in the recent years, and this is uh, kind of depressing that it's so fast-paced, it's developments that happened in the last two to three years. To catch up with this is always a challenge, but I do see uh, the added value of using this information to better interpret or to better understand what are the functional roles of the proteins that otherwise remain as this uh, dark, uh, what do people refer to it, dark um, biomass bio of unknown proteins that we don't know the function uh, of through sequence-based homology searches, but I think function has some uh, conservation that um, should help us to, to, to uh, better um, annotate genomes and, and make functional inferences. And if in the in the quest for trying to identify or conceptually define um, groups of organisms as a biologically relevant unit, uh, we are trying to use information from environmental genomics to uh, to to define groups that are evolutionarily because of the genome similarity and ecologically uh, cohesive because of uh, the environment where they occur to define these uh, groups. The next questions are, of course, why? What are the mechanisms that uh, niche partition uh, these organisms into diverse populations? And that's a lot of work that is still ahead. But uh, yeah, this is the slide about future outlook. So with this, uh, I would like to close um, by thanking um, the people that have been involved, this uh, collaborators, um, natural chemists, it's it's Jan Peel that has been an uh, institute colleague uh, that has been very um, critical in the experimental work that I was presenting, um, and prior colleagues that have um, supported various uh, aspects of, of the work that I was uh, just presenting. And of course, and maybe this is a shout out to um, communities or working groups that make this data available to allow people like our group to, to try to, to get this uh, organized and able, enable other people that may not have uh, the full resources available um, um, to, to do this type of work um, in, in, a, in a setting um, also for, for uh, research groups that do not have um, the, the immediate expertise. Um, so big thanks to, to data sharing community. Um, and with that, yeah, I would like to close and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dimit, for that amazing talk. And we like to start uh, our questions session with a question from a three minutes. So, Thank you for your uh, presentation. It was really insightful and, and I'm learning quite a lot. And you talk about this question of species. I know that this has been a really challenging question to address, especially if you're limited to data sets like with 16S. And my question is, if the goal is to understand the function of the microbiome and the relationship to the host, and we're using these new tools to try to understand the functional annotation of these microbes and their genes, does looking at it down to the species level matter. Is it that important to try to get the 16S down to say, these are individual species, or do we see a lot enough functional overlap between different species where we're saying, you know, at the genus or maybe family level, we can start making some more uh, concrete uh, inferences? Yeah. It's a very good question, a very relevant one. And uh, that uh, first response would be depends on your question, but I would just like to try to show an example. In the oceans, um, there is a group of organisms that are called trichodesmia. And they are cyanobacteria, and they have been studied in the laboratory because they can fix nitrogen. So they are one of the groups, uh, one of these organisms that uh, have a very um, important ecological function. Now, 
people did exactly what maybe you're, you're trying to, to question uh, and said, well, whenever we observe trichodesmium at the 16S level or at the genus level, this is an environment where like the more abundant these organisms are, the more um, active is this process, so more nitrogen is fixed by this community. Now through environmental genomics, and actually with this data set, um, we identified groups within trichodesmium, monophyletic, and they don't have, there's no way that they have the nitrogen fixing machinery. Um, which means that with names or with labels that we put on organisms uh, or groups of organisms, we, we may associate a function which is purely guilt by association. If you look at uh, these groups, you may be surprised to find exceptions, so quote unquote exceptions, because maybe they're even the rule, of, uh, that contradict your expectations. Um, and that is what we find um, in different examples of the environment. So, and ecologically speaking, this is not so surprising because there's the idea of the black queen hypothesis that if you have a function, but your close relatives or the others that are surrounded by you fulfill this function for you, there's no, uh, no need or there may be a benefit to uh, get rid of costly replication of the, of the machinery that is, that is required. So you may um, actually uh, find and so <clears throat> groups or species and only observe this at finer taxonomic resolution that are not uh, associated to a function that it was previously associated to because just quote unquote, just because uh, in the past somebody characterized an organism uh, with a specific trait. So this is one example, but there's, there's others uh, that I could also tell you about. But maybe not as part of this answer. That's a great so I think it is, it is important. Yeah. 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 Keeping with kind of species concept questions, some of my favorites, I appreciate you talking about them and about naming those organisms. Um, I'm curious why kind of out of hand you negated a biological species concept for bacteria. Oh, okay. And in particular, um, I think the work by Martin Holtz's group in, uh, does a really good job mm -hmm. of looking at the biological species concepts with genomic data or metagenomic data. And I'm, yeah. I'm curious whether you've used popcogen tea or something like that with some of these to look at those relationships. Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's a good point. And uh, you're, you're right, this was a quite strong statement. Um, it's what, I'm, what I was referring to is that the species concept, biological species concept that we have for larger organisms like uh, non-interbreeding populations is not applicable to, to bacteria, although there's different modes of replication and like um, sexual re or rearrangement or, um, sorry, um, recombination <laughs> is ob obviously observed between populations, but um, there's also populations that um, are reproducing um, just uh, by by asexual um, reproduction, so basically splitting. So it cannot be generalized for the, the microorganisms um, per se. So Martin Paul's work on, on um, recombination is very useful for those groups of microbial organisms where you can identify and measure actually um, or calculate distances between individuals or populations uh, when you take genomic uh, rearrangements in, into consideration. And this is very important, but does not uh, contradict or the uh, idea of, of um, ecologically cohesive and evolutionary cohesive uh, populations. So yes, um, the biological species or the mechanisms of biological uh, speciation do apply to microorganisms as well, but not across the whole board. That's the point I want to yeah, I'm just curious whether you've seen that kind of rearrangement in the ah. data set. Yeah. And that would be an exercise to follow up on, on the point where we said, now we have the definition or we have, see, we see the patterns of the populations themselves. Let's dive into the mechanisms that explain them. And this would be something very obvious to test. We have some other ideas that we would like to, to test what they explain. Dispersal potential, for example, spore formers, does this explain if populations are more uh, Degree of, of recombination within and between populations would be something easy to test. And yeah. thanks cool. for, for the input. We have time for one quick question, Kevin. Yeah, so 
Um, I was interested with all of the novel genes that you're finding, particularly at the lower depths. And I'm wondering, do you think those correspond to new functions or do you think that these genes are carrying out functions that happen in other places? They're just adapted to say high pressure. Like how many new functions do you think are coming out of that? Or do you think it's mostly stuff we've already seen? Yeah, I'm not gonna make a guess, <laughs> but uh, one part of that challenge is, so as I said, one of the issues I think why so many genes remain unknown is because the next relative for which a function for the homolog of this gene was characterized is too evolutionary. The second one is, Right now, what we do is we call everything unknown uh, as an unknown gene. But what may be very well possible is that within the pool of unknown genes, there is relationships so that within the unknown pool, there may be gene families themselves. So that would reduce the fraction or the space of, of unknownness to much smaller units. And um, I think that just would demonstrate that there's a concept uh, function for what, what we don't know. And then go gene family by gene family rather than gene by gene because uh, there is redundancy in this unknownness. And that would be the first step, maybe to have some uh, wild guess about how much of it uh, there could be. It's not our work, but our colleague uh, in Spain, um, Jaime Huerta Sepas, he published. Oh, it's on bioarchives, it's not out yet, um, but they have exactly attempted to um, look for across the unknown gene space in terms of how much redundancy is there, there actually. And I would refer you to this work to get some idea of, of how much this would be reduced without making wild well guesses. Okay. All right, I think we're done. We finished. Uh, Shin is gonna stay for a bit because we have lunch with Renis now. So if you are interested, you can approach him. And thank you again for an amazing semester. Thank you for being such an um, interested and, and active audience. And stay tuned for the next semester seminar because it's